Hey folks, welcome. We're about to start a new chapter today. This is chapter 8. It's on chemical reactions. We're going to really start to apply a lot of our formula writing skills that we've learned um, in previous chapters, as well as our ability to convert from grams to moles or moles to grams in this chapter and in the chapter after that. So if you're not up on those things, once again, I'd encourage you to go back and review the videos, particularly those videos on naming and formula writing. You're going to see how they're going to play a role on your upcoming homework assignments, particularly assignments 25 and 26. In fact, I hope at the end of this video to be able to, to do a bit of homework from assignment 25 for you. So stay tuned all the way to the end uh, for some homework help. Now, chapter 8 begins, uh, if you were to look on page 261 of your textbook, if you're using the blue book, uh, with this uh, equation. It says NH4, in parentheses, with a 2, and then Cr2O7, and then it has an S after that, in parentheses, and with an arrow. And then we'll see N2, with a G after it, Cr2O3, with an S after it, and then it has 4H2O with a G after it. Now this is a chemical equation. It's a sentence. Um, on the left-hand side of this arrow, we have what we call the reactants. So the reactants are those things on the left-hand side of the arrow. It's what we start with. It's what we begin with. It's what reacts. This arrow means to form. So this compound here reacts to form these compounds on the right-hand side. And these compounds on the right-hand side, I shouldn't just say compounds, compounds and elements are called my products. So my products are on the right hand side and my reactants are on the left hand side. Now these small letters or lowercase letters in parentheses here following the formula for each compound or element is the phase that we see that substance in. So you'll see S quite often of course that means the solid phase. We'll see G which you guessed it is the gaseous phase we'll see L, which is the liquid phase. And the one that I think you're most familiar with, because we had it in a previous chapter, is AQ. Now, every time I'll ask kids at this point, what does AQ mean? They say, oh, it means acid. No, it doesn't mean acid. Binary acids, remember, exist when they're dissolved in water. AQ tells me that they are dissolved in water. So it's dissolved in water. Now, AQ really stands for aqueous, but that simply means dissolved in water. Now, um, you should be able to tell that this reactant is ammonium dichromate. That's the formula for ammonium dichromate. Like I said, if you can't name compounds from the formula, you're going to need to go back and review some of our other notes. And ammonium dichromate reacts to form nitrogen gas, chromium 3 oxide, and water. Now this 4 in front of water is called the coefficient and that's used to help us balance the equation and you'll see how we do that in just a couple of minutes here. Now you'll notice that uh, the element nitrogen has a 2, a subscript 2 after it. That denotes that it's a diatomic element. Now diatomic elements are elements that are found in their <laughs> elemental state in pairs. So there are seven diatomic elements, and you actually need to know them. They are what I call the Brinkelhoff elements. Now I learned that from my ninth grade chemistry teacher at Williamsville East High School, Mr. Shiro, and he said, okay, there are seven diatomic elements. They are bromine, so Br2, iodine, I2, nitrogen, N2, chlorine, Cl2, hydrogen, H2, oxygen, O2, and fluorine, F2. So he said an easy way to remember this is just remember Brinkelhoff, because if you take bromine, iodine, nitrogen, chlorine, hydrogen, oxygen, fluorine, it spells out Brinkelhoff. Well, I've always remembered it, and that's been a long time, and it still works. So you see, nitrogen is one of those diatomic elements. So when I write it in its elemental form, I write it as a pair with a subscript 2 after it. Now, now the law of conservation of matter tells us that the re on the reactant side we have some atoms. And those same atoms need to appear on the product side in the same quantity. 
when they appear in the same quantity on both sides of the equation, we say that the equation is balanced. For instance, if we look at the one that the chapter starts with, do you see how there are two nitrogen atoms here and two nitrogen atoms on the product side? There are eight hydrogens. Remember, the two on the outside of the parentheses means we double what's inside. And on the product side, there's four water molecules. Well, each water molecule has two hydrogens, so four of them would have eight. So we have eight hydrogens on both sides, two chromiums on both sides, uh, seven oxygens. Let's see, we have three here plus four for my water. Yeah, that's seven. So this equation here is balanced. Now to balance equations, we need to remember a couple of different, a couple of rules. One big rule is this, and I'm going to write it down here and hope that you guys remember it. You never change or add subscripts. Never do that. Never change or add subscripts to balance an equation. So, let's go ahead and take a look at this first equation. You're going to see quickly, I hope, that it's balanced. I have two hydrogens on the left side and two on the right side. One oxygen and one oxygen, one carbon and one carbon. As that's written, it's balanced. It's a one to one to one to one mole ratio. It's perfect. Now, trust me, on your homework, you're not going to see too many of those. But every once in a while, I'll throw a bone at you, and you'll say, hey, Hummer took it easy on me tonight. That problem is already balanced. But take a look at number two. Does that look balanced to you? Right away, you can see there are three carbons on this side, and I only have one on this side. Now, the ill-informed student will want to add a subscript, and I want to put a three right there after carbon. I'll say, aha, I did it, C3O2. No, C3O2 doesn't even exist. You can't change the product carbon dioxide into a new product to balance it. You can't change or add subscripts. So another student might want to say, well, that's easy. I'll, I'll just erase that 3 after C3H8 and pretend it's not there. No, there's no such thing as CH8. You can't add or change subscripts because it changes the formula. It changes the compound that you're reacting or that you're producing. The only thing we can change or add are coefficients. So I'm going to put a 3 in front of carbon dioxide there. So I have 3 carbons here and 3 over there. I have 8 hydrogens on the reactant side. What can I put in front of water to give me 8 hydrogens on the product side? You guessed it, a 4, and that works. Now, my carbons are done and my hydrogens are balanced. I have oxygens left. I have 2 on the left side. I have six from my three carbon dioxide and four more from my four waters to give me a total of ten oxygens on the product side. So I'm going to put a five in front of the O2 and that gives me ten oxygens on the product side. So the ratio in this balanced equation is a one to five to three to four mole ratio. Now we like to balance these with the lowest whole number coefficients. You might be tempted to use fractions. In fact, later on this year, I let you use fractions. But for right now, let's balance all of these equations with the lowest whole number coefficient. Okay, take a look at number three. What do you notice quickly about number three? Well, there's one rhodium on both sides. Three oxygens on the reactant side. One plus two more gives me three on the product side. That bad boy is balanced, isn't it? Yeah, that's nice to you again. Take a look at number four. And remember, as we do these, you can always pause the video, try these on your own, and then depausify it and see how you did. It's a great way to learn how to do these. Practice, practice, practice. Okay, one palladium, one palladium. Sweet, they balance. Five iodines, two iodines. Hmm. Well, somebody might want to say, Hummer, how about if I put 2.5 in front of that? And I say, hmm, you know what, I have a hard time arguing with you. If I have two and a half I2s, that gives me five iodines on the product side to match up with the five on the reactant side. But what I'd like you to learn how to do just for now is to balance these with the lowest whole number coefficient. So instead of one to one to two and a half, let's double everything and make that a five, make that a two, and make that a two. So now there's two palladiums on both sides and 10 iodines on both sides. Okay? 
Number 5, KClO3 makes KCl and O2. One potassium on both sides, one chlorine on both sides. How about one and a half oxygens on this side? That gives me three oxygens and three. So let's double everything again. Put a two, a two, and change that to a three. And you see two potassiums, two chlorines, and six oxygens. Voila. Now these get pretty easy. The more and more you do, the more and more practice you get, the easier and easier it gets. Let's take a look at number six. Um, here's another little hint that I found that works. Um, if oxygen is present, save oxygen for last. That doesn't always work, but it's sort of helpful. Try that if you need to. So I'm going to weigh on my oxygens, okay? I have two antimonies on both sides, three sulfurs here. So if I put a three in front of SO2, that gives me three sulfurs on this side. Okay, so my antimonies are balanced with two on each side, and my sulfurs are balanced with three on each side. All I have is oxygen left. So I have four oxygens there, plus six more here for my three SO2s. That's a total of ten oxygens. So I'll put a five in front of O2, and we're done. Not too bad, is it? Number seven. Aluminium and hydrochloric acid form aluminium chloride and hydrogen gas. Now I can do my H's or my CL's first. I'm going to do my CL's. I'll put a three there. Gives me three chlorines on both sides. Uh, let's see, I have three hydrogens. I'll put a one and a half here just, to, just for a second. That gives me three, three H's on both sides. And then I can't have a fraction, so I need to double everything. Make that a three, make that a two, make this a six, and make that a two. So there's two aluminiums, six hydrogens on both sides, and six chlorines on both sides. Now, another little hint. Polyatomic ions sometimes travel as a group, and when they travel as a group, you can balance them as a group. For instance, do you see how these three nitrates travel all the way over here? Well, not quite all of them. I only have one nitrate here, and three over there. So instead of balancing the nitrogen and the oxygen separately, let's balance the nitrate, nitrate ion. Put a three there, so now I've got three nitrates on both sides. And do you see how hydroxides do the same thing? Three hydroxides here, one here. So I'll put a three in front of NaOH, and it gives me three hydroxides on both sides. Now check this out. The sodiums balance now, don't they? Three and three, and so do the lanthanums. So this small ratio, kiddos, is one to three to one to three. Sorry, my printer's running here. We'll try to ignore that for a second. Okay, just a couple more. Number nine, hmm, here's another little hint. Do you see how water is in, in the equation? If water's in the equation, put a little star down here, if water's present, we will save our H's and our O's for last. So we'll do them at the end. So that helps a lot, okay? All right, let's take a look at number nine. Uh, I have phosphates, and the phosphates travel as a group. Do you see that? There's one phosphate here, two over on this side. So I'll put a big two in front of that. It gives me two phosphates on both sides. Okay. Bariums. There's three bariums and only one barium there, so I'll put a three to give me three bariums. And now all I have are hydrogens and oxygens left. Pick one of them. Well, let's pick hydrogens. Do you see that I have six hydrogens here? All right, there's two in, inside the parentheses, and there's three of these molecules. So it's six there, plus six more is 12. Can't I put a six in front of H2O to give me 12 hydrogens? I sure can. So now the hydrogens are balanced, will balance. And what's pretty cool is once those are balanced, the oxygens oftentimes take care of themselves. I have six oxygens here, plus eight more is 14. I have six here, plus eight is 14. Voila. It's done. Okay, number 10. Our last one uh, in this set is ammonium sulfate and magnesium hydroxide react to form magnesium sulfate, ammonia, and water. Now, I don't see polyatomic ions traveling as a group this time. The ammonium turns into ammonia. 
So it doesn't travel as a group. And the sulfates, I guess they travel as a group, but there's one of each, so I don't need to do anything there. So let's start with nitrogens. I have two nitrogens here. Let's put a two in front of NH3 to give me two nitrogens. And let's see, one sulfate, one magnesium. I have H's and O's left, so let's balance those. Let's pick the oxygens this time. Four oxygens here, plus two more is six. I have four oxygens there. So if I put a two in front of water, that gives me two more oxygens for a total of six. And number 10 is done. Pretty easy. It goes pretty fast once you get some practice. Now, when you guys do your homework, and it looks like I'm not going to have time at the end of this video, I'm going to do a separate video for you here in just a minute to help you with assignment 25. But um, as you practice these, you'll get really good. And uh, it does start out to be difficult at first. But just practice, practice, practice. And trust me, you'll get very fast at this very quickly. It's really not that bad. So stay tuned. Uh, the next video I do for you, I'm going to do some of assignment 25, a little homework help. Okay? All right, guys. Catch you later. Bye-bye.